Well, some of you are wired just a little bit differently. I want you to raise your hands if you know that there is a page in the beginning of instruction manuals that gives you all of the supplies you need to build whatever you're going to build. You seen that page? Okay, they tell me it's there. I, I wouldn't know. Um, but there is a page in the beginning of instruction. Are you putting together a play set or something, you know, a big piece of furniture, that sort of thing? You know that that first, you go searching for that first page if you find the instruction manual at all. But you find that first page and it shows you the number of screws that you should have. And some of you actually count those screws. Uh, it shows you bolts and nuts and all of that that you should have. And some of you actually go and make sure. And if you don't, you won't start the project because you'll just be frustrated. If you're like me, you jump to the end of the book and see the picture of what you're building and go, we'll be all right, right? Like I've got some stuff in the garage, I could probably piece some stuff together. Some of you are just wired in this way where you liked it in the days of music when if you wanted to hear a song that was in the middle of an album, you had to listen to the whole album, right? You, you couldn't just skip to it or you couldn't buy a single song like the Spotify days. If you've ever been to an Ikea store, they actually produce some of that furniture that you've put together. But the store was originally, um, when you would go back in the day, they would they had these arrows that you would go all the way through the store and you'd follow the arrows and there was really not many ways that you could like skip. So you went through everything. It was like to progress through the store. It was like an adventure. Every time you went there, you couldn't just jump straight to the meatballs at the end, right? You had to go through everything. And some of you like that. You like the progression. Things go in order. They're organized. Some of you are wired this way. And some of you are married to people who are not wired this way. This is not a testimony. This is just hypothetical. But it makes your life interesting. I'll just say interesting. We've been in this series of this to that. And we're exploring these seven journeys that every Christian must take um, as, you, as you walk closer and closer to Jesus. To become a disciple that makes disciples, you spend your life traveling these seven journeys. And, and before we get to our fourth journey today, I'd like to remind us all that these are journeys, not races. Uh, that these are journeys, not destinations. If you're the type of person that wants to go on, you know, that goes on vacation and you want to plan out every single point and stop on the map, you might see the spiritual journey in that way. You're like, okay, well, I've, I've, I've mastered this part and now I can move to this part and now I can level up here. I can take this step up here. You see, your spiritual life is more like a baseball game where it's like, I've got to make it to first base before I can get to second base and then third and then home. And so it's this progression of it. But this is not a race. This is not... Um, the spiritual journeys are not linear, and, and neither is our spiritual life. You don't graduate from last week's sermon to this week's sermon. You can be in multiple journeys at once. The, the guy who wrote the book, literally, on the seven journeys, his name is Roy Moran, and he says it this way. As the Spirit teaches and moves in your life, you can flow from one to the other. They are digital. This, I found this on his website literally, digital. Rather than analog, like a cassette tape, you don't have to go through all of the songs to get to the one you want. You simply can go, you, you simply go right to it. So too with the Spirit, with which interacting with us can move freely from one area to the other. We went to the zoo yesterday, and there's two ways that you can experience our zoo. You can look at the big map, as one of my kids likes to do, and he wants to make the whole loop and all of the inner, inner loops and all of that. He wants to see everything. My other kid is chaos, and she just wants to go where all the people are, and she just, you know, dart from one thing to the next to the next, and she's like, we see there's a group of people with the lions. We go to the lions. We see that there's, you know, the spirit leads us to the giraffes, which it always leads us to the giraffes. We just stay there the whole time. So um, that, that, some of you are wired in the way where you just want to see your spiritual life like as like a stairway to heaven. You know, like you're going up, we're going, you know, as long as we keep on climbing, and it's like this linear, I've, I've mastered this, then this, then this. So Roy writes on his website that often when we think of our spiritual life like that, um, we're missing three key understandings, missing some big understandings of what it means to progress towards Jesus. And here's, here's the three, and we'll, we'll visit these here, and then we'll come back to them at the end as well. Here's the first one that he says, is that we have to remember that um, what we think is good and right can actually be disruptive to our spiritual growth. What we think is the right path can often be disruptive to where we grow. How, how are my feelings disrupting my spiritual growth? Well, that's not the path that I wanted to take, or that's not the, that's not the direction I thought this was going to go. That's not the person I wanted to reach out to. 
or that's not the place I wanted to be. So a lot of times our preferences or our traditions or our thoughts invade what God is trying to do in us. The second thing he mentions is that we are worse off than we think, but we're more loved than we could ever imagine. That's a huge dichotomy to remember in spiritual growth is that we we tend to justify our behavior, right? We tend to think that we're doing a lot better than we actually are. We tend to see our sin and we look at it and go, that's not really that bad. Have you seen their sin? But we're worse off than we think. How am I sugarcoating my shortcomings? How am I taking advantage of the love and the blessings that have been given to me, the second chance in this life that I have been given when it comes to sin? What what secret sin is going to keep me from growing closer to God and others? And do I really believe that God is strong enough to break the strongholds in my life? We're worse off than we think, but we're more loved than we could ever imagine. The third understanding that, that Roy writes in his blog is that we won't grow as fast as we desire. Am I trying to set some kind of like spiritual record on how fast I got close to Jesus? Like, am I supposed to, you know, am I, am I running so hard and so fast that I'm just going to complete it all in a couple years and then I can just coast the rest of the way? Am I finally trying to, you know, what, what am I missing if I skip the slow growth? What am I going to miss if I'm concerned with being busy like, you know, like, like Martha in the kitchen when I should be sitting at the feet of Jesus and learning from his teachings? like Mary. Uh, We'll come back to these questions at the end, but I want to jump into today's journey, the fourth journey from charitable to extravagant. Charitable to extravagant. Now, when I first heard the title of this and I saw the text, I was like, charitable seems like a good place to be. Like when you say that somebody is charitable, you're not usually using that as an insult. But in our Christian life, we want to take good to even better. We want to go um, not just be charitable, pe- charitable people, but we want to be extravagant giving people. So from charitable to extravagant, we're going to talk about giving this morning. I find it very interesting how this sermon calendar worked out. Um, I saw Wayne here, but he's not preaching, so take that for what it's worth. Um, find in your Bible 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And while you're getting there, I want to share an unwritten rule of our household. Um, I'm not allowed to answer the door, okay? Some of you know where this is going. Um, the, the amount of times that I've been talked into buying something or had like hour-long conversations with someone just stopping by, um, it's, it's, it's really staggering. I'm actually the reason we were allowed to get one of those cool video doorbells um, so that I can look, I'm like a child, like I can look before I open the door so I'm not blindsided by something. Because my wife knows that, that if, if I open that door and there's a good sales pitch, that I'm toast, right? I'm too nice. I'm too gullible. I want to talk to people. I enjoy it. I'm usually, like if I'm home by myself watching the kids, I'll be like, yeah, I'll talk to you for an hour because we're arguing over something that means nothing. But uh, what, do you want to, what do you want to sell me? Um, So whatever it is, I'm in. Girl Scout cookies, home security systems. If you started a new cult, just come to my house. We'll chat about it. I will at least talk to you about it, okay? Because I'm going to listen. I just can't help it. I, I, every, every salesperson in this, in this service was just like, I need to speak to you after church. You're like, I don't care what you're selling, whatever it is. Like, but if you're like me and you, you're like that and you've been talked into, coerced into some of those things before, you'll likely understand this as well. Almost every time after I shut the door or after I purchase the thing or agree to whatever it was, I get that sinking feeling in my stomach that... Um, that I've just done something wrong, that, I've, that I've, I've been talked into something and I can start to think of all of the ways, the things that I should have said or the, you know, the ways that I should have come back when he said, you know, like a guy told me on my porch, this was yesterday, he's like, what, you don't like saving money? And I was like, ah, you got me. Um, so I'll tell you the worst one that ever happened to me. Me and my wife had just got engaged and she thought it would be a good idea because I am translucent if we bought a tanning package to, uh, I know, right, uh, that if we did that. And so she sent me, it was before she knew me, um, to the, the tanning salon to buy a package for the six months that we'd be engaged. So I could, I could you know, we could get tan. And, um, and so I go in there, and they had just opened the place. And so they probably didn't have very many customers. And so she had, like, all the time in the world to talk to me. And I was like, we're looking to get, you know, a tanning package. And she saw, she saw me and was like, 
you know, blank canvas and was like, we can do amazing things with you. So she could have sold me a tanning bed that day. I was so gullible. She was like, okay, she signs up. I ended up with a three-year package, (laughs) unlimited tanning for both of us. And we were moving in like, after our wedding, we moved to Texas. So like, there was not going to be tanning in, in Missouri with this, this one little location. And uh, so I, I just knew, driving away from that parking lot, I was like, I, I did my duty for the day, and then that feeling came. I was like, we're about to have our first premarital marital fight, right? Like, this is going to be the first in a long run of things that, you know, this, this is just kind of showing. I'm kind of showing my cards early on, right? So if you're curious, I went twice. I went two times. Um, and then I think we got some way that we could, you know, cancel it or what. But if you're like me, you know what that feels like. That shoulda, coulda, woulda, like I, I wish I would've said this, I wish I would've done. No one likes that feeling, regardless of if you're a good salesperson or if you're gullible or not. No one likes that feeling of being swindled or coerced or, you know, tricked into buying something. And so when we get to 2 Corinthians, Paul has planted this church in Corinth and he's written at least four letters to, to the church in Corinth. This is his final letter that he would write. But um, as he writes this letter, he's starting to talk about this idea. It's like he was, he was going to come to the church in Corinth. He's going to visit the church that he planted. And he spends two whole chapters talking about generosity. It had become a custom that when Paul and his entourage would show up to your town, he had planted this church. They had respect for Paul. He was an apostle of Christ. And he was doing the Lord's work while he would plant a church and then leave and go plant another church. When he came back to the church, he would you know, present what God is doing around the world, that, that people are being saved and that, that disciples are being made, and that church would take up an offering. But they would already have that offering prepared because it would take a long time for Paul. It would be like you know, years before he would get back to the church. And we'll see in the text that it had already been uh, multiple years, and they were already planning to give to Paul. But what he doesn't want is to show up, and in, first and second, in between 1st and 2nd Corinthians, we see that there's actually some, there'd been some rumors starting to spread about Paul's ministry. Uh, rumors and false teachings that, that people were, were, there's a swelling thought that Paul wasn't actually an apostle, that he was just in it for the money or notoriety. And so actually in 2 Corinthians, he spends the first seven chapters proving the opposite, talking, proving his apostleship. And then in chapters eight and nine, he focuses back on the offering because Paul doesn't want to show up on the doorstep of the first Corinthian church in the first century and say, um, I'm ready, you know, are you ready to give? And they're like, oh, we had other plans. You know, and somebody had convinced them to do otherwise. He doesn't want to try to convince them to buy what he's selling. So in chapter eight, it's, uh, chapter eight is focused on like what to give. He's like, what should your heart look like when you give? What's the amount that you should give? If you've ever kind of struggled with that, you'd be like, how much do I give? Do I start with the percentage? Do I start with that? Read 2 Corinthians chapter eight. Paul gives the church instructions. And he, and he essentially just goes through and he says, this is how you should determine. If you have just a little bit, you're, you're, you're gonna give just a little bit. If you have excess, you're going, if you have a lot, you're going to give a lot. So it's not gonna be like we're expecting like a flat tax on everybody throughout the church. Like everybody has to give at this dollar amount. It was the church taking care of one another and those who have more would give more. Those who have less would give less. And it wasn't like a, it wasn't a competition. And so that, uh, chapter eight, he talks about what to give and how you approach that in that way. Chapter nine, he focuses more on why. And he wants to motivate the Corinthian church why they should give. Here's what he says, starting in verse 1. Now, concerning the ministry to the saints, he's talking about the the offering that they they will take up when he gets there. It is unnecessary for me to write to you, for I know your eagerness, for I boast about you to the Macedonians. Achaia has been ready since last year. Your zeal has stirred up most of them. But I am sending the brothers so so that our boasting about you in this matter would not prove empty, so that you would be ready, just as I said. Otherwise, if the Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared, we, not to mention you, would be put to shame in that situation. Paul is trying to save the church in Corinth a lot of embarrassment. He's trying to save himself a lot of embarrassment. He's been telling the Macedonians, you won't believe how charitable the church in Corinth is. It's crazy. They've been waiting a whole year. They're just chomping at the bit. They cannot wait to give. They're so extravagant. And he says that there is a risk that he would show up with some of these Macedonians. And when he shows up, 
they're not ready to give. Or they're not as charitable as they promised before. They've been, you know, people have told them that, you know, eh, maybe Paul doesn't actually need the money. He's doing quite well. Or maybe he's not really an apostle. Or maybe we could put these efforts somewhere else. So Paul just wants to make sure. He's going to send some people ahead to make sure that that offering is ready. This is not like sending the goons out to go, like, you guys better be ready to give. Like, Paul's coming. And he's going, you know, it's not like that. He's sending them to encourage them to be ready, to be cheerful givers. And the last thing that he wants is to show up and for everyone to be shamed, for it to be this embarrassment. Some of you have been in these types of services where someone's asking for money, and everybody's like, we're not giving you money. And everybody's like, well, okay. You know, like, what are we going to do? Maybe you grew up in a church where missionaries would visit, and this is like us. They would come, and they would bring their, you know, their outdated slide machine, and they would click through all the slides, and then at the end, they would take up an offering. This is what Paul is doing here. But he doesn't want it to feel coerced. He doesn't want them to be, um, to feel like they're, they're, they're forced to do it. So Paul is teaching this young church the principles of extravagant giving. Uh, they had generous hearts. At least the last time he talked to them, he knew they did. And Paul is asking them to take this journey from merely being charitable people to being extravagant givers. He doesn't want them to be defined by, well, it was the thought that counts. We were ready to give, but, you know, we're charitable people. But he wants them to be known for an attitude of whatever it takes to spread the gospel to the world. Here's the first thing that Paul wants the Corinthian church to understand. When you give extravagantly, you deny yourself and you bless others. You deny yourself and you bless others. There are a couple different kinds of blessings that can come from, from the giving of the Corinthians. The first one is obvious. It's, it's that, that Paul and his mission needed funds and money to the next place they would go and that they would spread the gospel to the next place. They can't just travel without any money. And so they would, it would help them in that way. And Paul and the missionaries were taking the gospel to the unreached parts of the world. The, the, one commentator pointed out that, his, that this act of giving carried more than just money with it. It wasn't just to, to pay for the next meal for the missionaries. It wasn't just to, you know, to get them to the next place where they would stay. But it was actually an act of of blessing to all of the other churches, including the Jerusalem churches. There in the early, in the early days of the church, you had, um, you know, much like our church can be segre segregated now, you had, you had the Jewish Jerusalem churches, kind of the OG churches, right? And then you had all these little church plants that were all spread about, a lot of Gentile churches. And what a blessing it would be for the, the church of Corinth to give back to those struggling churches in Jerusalem. Like, like how, how big of a blessing would that be? Not only in financially, but to see the Gentile Christians supporting the Jerusalem churches as a sign of unity. Imagine the church plant supplying the mother church. The second way that this blesses, not just blessing Paul's ministry and unifying the church, but the second way is that Paul knows the impact that generosity has. That it's gonna bless other people just through the fact that someone else was generous. These Macedonians that are traveling with him, he says, he says they're going to see the gift and they're going to be motivated to give. They're going to understand that what we're doing here is important because they'll be motivated. When you have a, a group of people behind you financially backing you with something, that means they believe in you. And generosity is contagious. If you've ever been a part of, a, of like a charity auction where it really becomes more about the charity than the items that are on the table for sale, and you see people just bid and go bid and higher and higher and higher. And you see things that aren't worth that much money go for thousands and thousands of dollars over price. And you see, you see bidders from across the room kind of smiling at each other and poking at each other to see how high they could get the bid. And then by the end of the night, everybody just gives all of the money anyway. It wasn't really about the auction. It was about giving to the cause. The smiles on the faces of everyone, it's contagious. Now, I've been in those circumstances, and I see them go like, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars over the price, and I'm like, and my wife's like, mm. <laughs> I don't even get one of the little signs. Like, that's, I don't even get one of those. Like, I just go for the meal, okay? But like, that, that idea is like, you're just eager because other people, it's contagious. But just like extravagant giving can be contagious, selfishness can also be contagious. Paul knows this. He knows if he shows up with these Macedonians and the churches all of a sudden have got their hands in their pocket, like, I don't know what you're talking about. Like, we weren't, we weren't planning on giving you anything. Or they get real stingy and real weird about it. Paul understands that now the Macedonians are going to start to question the work. They're going to say, does anybody have our back? Are we, are we motivated? To, are we, can we actually accomplish this? Does anybody believe in the cause? 
It makes Paul look like a liar. It makes the church look stingy and unprepared. And it makes the Macedonians start to wonder, is this the real deal? Look at verse 9. Therefore, I considered it necessary, or verse 5, sorry. I considered it necessary to urge the brothers to go ahead of you and arrange in advance the generous gift that you promised. So that it will be ready as a gift and not as an extortion. So Paul's like, I'm not above bringing the hammer. But he says, I want this to be an extravagant gift. I want you to remember the commitment that you made. I want you to remember how excited you were to give. But instead, you know, instead it, it kind of looks like I might show up and have to like talk you in or out of it. Paul doesn't want to be begging stingy people to give money. You know, I've sat across the table from ministry partners before, uh, young students or people just graduating college, just getting in, going as, to be missionaries or going to be um, campus ministers or ministers, and they sign up with a ministry, and the first thing the ministry tells them is, all right, here's how much money you have to raise in the next six months, okay? I've sat down with multiple people just over the last couple months because school's getting ready to start and ministries are getting ready to start up. Sitting down with these people, sometimes it often feels like more of a, um, of a, of a pitch for money than it does of like, tell me about your ministry. I always make sure I stop and go like, tell me what you're doing. <laughs> like, I know you need money. I know that's why we're here. I know that's why you bought me this coffee. Um, I, know, I know that that is a financial need, but what are you doing Paul wants to go and he wants to, he wants to report to the Corinthian church all of the amazing things that are happening in the kingdom of God. He wants, to sit, he wants to go and tell them of the baptisms and the disciples that are being made. He wants to go and give them the joyous news of, that the gospel is doing throughout the world. He doesn't want to spend his time coercing them and talking them into his mission and his ministry. He encourages the Christians to deny themselves and bless the ministry. Those, uh, bless, bless those who will be encouraged by the generosity and be extravagant givers. It's a journey of sacrifice. He's asking them to remember that what you give here will impact others, will bless others. And he doesn't want to be stingy. There's a, there's a legend of the Middle Ages, which I thought would be appropriate as we walk through the catacombs here. Um, but it's, it's, been, it's been obtained to like Charlemagne, and some say it was Ivan the Terrible, some say it was the Knights Templar, so it's a little, a little sketchy on some of the details, and it may not even be a true story, but here we go, okay? Um, there's this story, and I remember hearing it as, as a young kid. Uh, in, the middle, in, the, in the Middle Ages, when an entire army was converted to Christianity, and we can talk about the validity of that, it should be like, it was probably like Somebody like Ivan the Terrible who said, be a Christian. And they're like, yes, sir, you know. So they all march down into the river to be baptized. You might have heard this story before. And just before they're baptized, they take their swords and they pull them up in the air. And as they're baptized, they leave their swords exposed in the air. And, and this, this image has kind of stuck with me as I've heard that. Because it's an idea, this, this idea of like, they didn't want their swords to be baptized because they were going to do some very unholy things with those swords. And I wonder how often we as Christians climb into the baptistry and we take our wallets or our purses or our credit cards and we, we hold them up high and we let everything else of our body get dunked in the water, but we hold up our money, we hold up our treasure because we're going to do some unholy things with this money. And we don't want that to be affected in that way. I think it was Spurgeon that said, with some of, our, some of the last parts of our nature that ever gets sanctified is the pocket. And Paul would later warn Timothy as he writes a letter to him at his young church in Ephesus. It's the verse that says, the, the, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. But the second part of that verse says this. Here's the, here's the catch. Here's the, here's the problem with that. Some have already wandered away from the truth faith because they craved it and what it had to offer. But when reaching for the prize, they found their hands and hearts pierced with many sorrows. You see, extravagant givers deny themselves and bless others. But that's not where the blessings stop. It's not just, uh, it's not just blessing others when it comes to extravagant giving. Look at what he says in verses 5 through 7. It says, the point is this. So Paul's going to get down to some more teaching. The person who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. The person who sows generously will reap generously. You know this from gardening, if you garden. Each person should do as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or out of compulsion, since God loves a cheerful giver. Now, I grew up hearing this verse like 
when somebody was ready for an offering time, it was, God loves a cheerful giver, so it's time to cheerfully give, you know? Don't be crying, just give the money and laugh about it, right? So God loves a cheerful giver. What we, what we gotta remember is, I, I've heard this, this verse misused a lot. Um, each person should do as he has decided in his heart. Because I think, I think a lot of times we think of that as the amount that we're giving. And actually, Paul is not talking about amount at all in chapter nine. Chapter eight, he talks a lot about amount. He says, if you have a lot, you should give a lot. If you have a little, you should give a little. He kind of sets those parameters there. In, in, verse, in chapter nine, like I said, he's talking about how we give, not what we give. And so often we look at that verse and we go, each person has decided in his heart, well, my heart is telling me, uh-uh. Like, bottom line, I can throw some pennies in, but this is not about how much, this is about how. Not reluctantly or out of compulsion since God loves a cheerful giver. Here's the second main point. When you give extravagantly, you allow God to bless you. So not only are you allowed to bless others, you're allowing God to bless you. Paul has mentioned that there are a couple different ways to give. He said this in verse five and in verse seven, there are two different words he uses here. One is compulsively, like on a whim, like strange, like I've been talked into it and coerced, or cheerfully. One will make you bitter and wish you hadn't given. The other will make you motivated to give more. So we're going to nerd out for just a second on some Greek words. So this is nap time if you want to do that. Um, this first word that is the word for compulsion or give, to give compulsively, um, it's the word ananke. Say that with me, ananke. Oh, I said with me, but okay, ananke, right. Uh, Ananke was uh, actually the name of a Greek goddess, the Greek goddess of um, inevitability. So she's kind of like the Thanos of the Greek world, right? So like inevitability, I am inevitable. What's going to happen is going to happen. If you've ever been in one of those sales pitch moments where you've already, you're like, I know what's gonna happen here. Like we're not getting out of this room unless we're signing that, right? Like coercion, this is the goddess of inevitability they, they would have, they've been conversed or bugged so long that, that it's just inevitable. Like we're gonna push so many things at you. Paul says, I don't wanna come and have to just say it over and over and over again, the work that God is doing, and then have to give you another story and another story. I don't wanna have to, you know, get all the tears flowing and all that and then go, okay, now we're gonna give. We've got them where we want them. It's kind of like walking into Bass Pro, you know, the vacation sales, right? If you wear your camo and you go the back way, they won't see you. Um, but like, I, I, I mean, I'll walk with my phone all the time, but when I go in there, for sure, I'm doing something on my phone. It's like, okay, I don't wanna get sucked into there, right, okay? Um, and then there's another place on down the way where if you go over there, there's another thing of trying to get you into a, a membership or sort of thing, okay? I survived that part, okay? The initial waves of all that. I got what I needed, got my beef jerky, okay? And I went to the front counter. And before you check out, they ask you, would you like to donate to this? I'm like, no, thank you. You go to swipe your card. Would you, like to, would you like to plant a tree in Siberia? I don't know. It's something like, I didn't read the fine print. But they're like, would you like to do this? Would you like to save the fish? Would you like to save the dogs? Would you like to save? And at some point, I'm just like, you know what? I would like to save the dogs, right? If it would save me five seconds of saying no or clicking or whatever, I'll save the dogs. How many dogs did I save? Well, you know, I don't know. I have no idea because I just wanted to leave, right? That's what coercion feels like when you get so many things just bombarded at you. And, and Paul is like, I don't wanna come into your church and spend a whole service trying to convince you to give. If you believe in the message, cheerfully give. But if you don't, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna you know, he actually calls it extortion. I'm not gonna extort you in this way. But the secret actually to compulsion giving, see, we think that if we give that the cause will leave us alone, right? And no, then we're left with that feeling of that we gave for the wrong reason. But we're also like, they're not gonna stop. <laughs> they're gonna ask you the next time and the next time and the next time. It's not extravagant, it's expectant. It's like, it's inevitable. The second word that we see there is that word for cheerful. You've heard that verse, God loves a cheerful giver. The, the Greek word there is hilaros. Say it with me, hilaros. You can see the English word in there, right? And we stole a little bit of that Greek word and, and, and made the word hilarious in there. And this is not like when somebody gives you a sales pitch, you should just laugh in their face. It's not that kind of hilarious, although that can be fun if you just laugh. Um, but you see, uh, I, you know, 
I've said it this way before. Like, I have, I, have, I have two kids, and they're both very ticklish, okay? They're just eager to be tickled, right? Any kind of wrestling match, anything like that, where I, that's like my ultimate move. I can just, you know, look for ribs, poke them, and I'm out of the whatever headlock he's got me in, okay? I can get out, you know, they, they just love to be tickled. Maybe they don't love it, but I love it, okay? Um, and there comes a point where they are so worked up and so ticklish, I don't even have to touch them, Right? Like, I, I can, like, I become, like, the greatest dad because I could just, like, sit down <laughs> and I can just wait for them to come towards me and it's like the force. I can just go like this and they just start laughing and fall over. It's the greatest thing ever. It's awesome. And it's so great to hear them laugh and to hear them have fun and I don't have to wrestle with them anymore. So this, this idea, when I hear this verse, hilarious, when I hear this, I, this idea of giving hilariously, it's that willingness to be cheerful even, even before you've heard the cause. Even before you've heard the cause. You know that Paul is coming to your church. You've heard about Paul. You are so sold out for the gospel. You are so in on the message of Christ going to all people. But you're just like, I hope, they, I hope they give me an opportunity to give to this cause. Maybe you found yourself in that place before where you don't even have to be talked to. You, you seek it out. You're like, Paul, how can we? We've been waiting a year. How can we give this is how God wants us to feel about giving. So ready to give before the opportunity is even there. Looking for ways to be generous. Finding unique ways to bless people. Some of the most fun that you will ever have with your money is giving it to somebody that doesn't know where it came from and just watching God bless them through that. You know what would ruin that moment? Is to go like, hey, I gave that to you. You should say thank you, right? That kind of ruins the point, right? A joyful giver is just out of out of the overflow of your heart, you're a generous person. You're giving. Extravagant giving is cheerful giving. It's giving that often leaves us laughing at the ways that God provides in turn. I've, I've lost count of how many times we as a family have stepped out in faith. We've been extravagantly generous in, in one way or another, whether it's helping somebody you know, in our neighborhood or helping you know, just a, a cause here at the church. And how many times we have just been in awe almost laughably, when God provides. And it's not always money. It's not always money. Sometimes it's, it's the absence of money. We're like, we thought we really needed that. And look, look what God has done with it when we let go of it. Um, look at verse eight. Paul talks about the blessings that come to you from giving. And God is able to make every grace overflow to you so that in every way, always having everything you need, you may excel in every good work. Notice he doesn't mention money there. He doesn't mention you're going to be paid back tenfold if you, you know, if you give this much, you're going to give this much. It's not an equation. God's economy runs on grace and spiritual blessings, not the return of investment. And also, God doesn't need your money. But he's often asking us to, to, to let go so that he can do more with it than it would if we were just clenching our, our fist. My, my buddy Titus Benton wrote a book called Grip years back. We did a sermon series on it. It was the whole point of the book is that the tighter that we grip my mon- our money, the less that God can do with it. We think if I hold on to it, if I hoard it, if I let it, you know, if I don't let any of it go, I'm more, I'm more responsible, <laughs> more responsible than God. I can bless myself with this money, but when we release our grip on what has been provided to us, we can, we can bless others with that money. Aaron Brockett says it this way, God doesn't need your money, but he knows your money has your heart. He wants your heart, and so he's asking you to let go of your money. When we walk the journey from generous to extravagant, when we walk closer to Jesus and being a joyful, cheerful giver, we become people that, that, that feel the blessing of God no matter the circumstances. We loosen our grip on our money because we know that it's not ours to hold tightly. We bless others when we have excess. We find joy in being generous because we know that God has supplied our every need. Look at what Paul says in verse 10. The same one who has put seed into the hands of the sower and brought, and brought bread to fill our stomachs will provide and multiply the resources you invest and produce an abundant harvest from your righteous action. You will be made rich in everything so that your generosity will spill over in every direction through us, your generosity is at work in inspiring praise and thanksgiving to God. Extravagant givers, we refuse blessing to, to pool up around us. Where, where we're just like, 
swimming in God's blessing and we don't really care what everybody else is doing. Like God just continues to pour it on me. I'm so blessed, I'm so blessed. Everything is just great for me. One, one preacher says it this way, the goal is to be a conduit, not a container. Be a conduit, not a container. Paul shows the early church that when we cheerfully give, of course, we're blessing others and, and in turn, we will feel blessed and, and rewarded because God is using that blessing. When God blesses us, we let it overflow in every direction. It's now spilling out everywhere. There's no way to contain it because we're just a conduit. We're not letting it pool up around us. We're letting it overflow to the people around us, to the people in need. Be a conduit, not a container. And so Paul finally reminds the most important lesson for the Corinthians and for us as an extravagant giver is when you give extravagantly, you ensure that God gets the glory. This one's last because it's most important and it can't be left out. Extravagant givers are obsessed with who gets the credit but not in the way that you usually think of that, right? Most people revel in their name on a building or the legacy they left behind or an endowment or inheritance, but even more so, extravagant givers are obsessed with giving God the glory. It's, it, it's almost annoying sometimes, <laughs> you know? Like if you've ever met someone who's just extravagantly giving out of what God has blessed them, that's like money just can't even stick to them. They're just like so generous. Have you ever been around somebody like that? You're just like, can you just like, can you just take a little bit of credit? <laughs> you know, like uh, maybe it just makes us feel bad about ourselves. Like, no, I would want, you know, like put my name on that building, right? Name that after me. Make sure you walk me up in front of the church and tell them how much I gave. But sometimes when we see money is not a blessing, but as something that we deserve or that we, we are entitled to, we feel that way. But extravagant givers, they're obsessed with giving God the glory. Look at what Paul does in, in, in verse 12. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but it is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the proof provided by this ministry, they will glorify God for your obedient confession in the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone. God gets the glory. God gets the glory. This is the promise of giving to missions, that God gets the glory. Because it's crazy to think that we would get the glory. It's crazy to think that someone, uh, a Muslim teenager in North Africa who's browsing the internet looking for information about Jesus, encounters one of our workers there, they're not going to know that you gave $20 to Northside's Global Outreach Fund. But the connection that they'll make with a believer in their country that can introduce them to Jesus, these are not made up stories. This is happening right now. All the glory goes to God. For the child in India who has access to health care through the children's hospital at Central India Christian Mission. They live long enough to hear the gospel message. They may never meet you. They may never even know what Northside Christian Church is, but God gets all the glory. The tribe in Kenya who's worshiping with a roof over their head, with a church that they can go inside of, sheltered from the sun, sheltered from the wind and, and the rain, this gift's made possible by, by a lot of giving that's happened from this very room. They may never travel to the U.S. or see how God has blessed them or see who blessed them through God, but all the glory goes to God. From the local workers and our partners here, from Victory Mission to the neighbors that you provide for, to the slums of India, your cheerful gift, each time you let it throw, flow through you, God gets all the glory. And that should be the goal. It should be the goal to give and step out of the way. When we walk this journey and we change from containers to conduit, we use our resources to bless people. We fully understand that money is a gift from God and we're not gonna pool it up. And I think we could even say this, that in a, in a greedy and selfish world, that your bank statement may be the clearest indicator of how close you're walking with Jesus. Paul is calling this church to extravagantly give. But it's so important who gets the glory. He's been praising the Corinthian church to the Macedonians. He's like, you won't believe it. They're amazing. It's great. He's giving that praise. He wants to make sure that they're not in it for that praise. When we see the money as ours, we tend to feel entitled to our blessings. We spend it differently. We only see what we want to see. We don't see the needs of others. We want credit for how hard we worked or how much we gave or how much we've hoarded and piled up. 
There's a pastor in, in Dallas, J.P. Pecluda, says it this way, what, what you do with someone else's resources shows you what you really believe. Now, I remember driving my dad's car and how differently I drove it from when I got my car. I don't think my dad ever had car problems before I drove his car, right? Like, it was always me. Like, it was always like, oh, I drove it last night and it's broken down the next morning. Causation, correlation, who knows, whatever. Um, But I just remember the difference in feeling. Of like, when I'm driving dad's car, I don't gotta worry about putting gas in it in the morning. I mean, I I didn't have to worry about it one time, but every other time I worried about it. But like, I I just drove it differently. I grind the gears, both the car and my dad's, a little bit differently in that car because I didn't make the repairs. It wasn't my car. It was dad's car. And I felt entitled to it because I was his son and I could, you know, he let me borrow the car. How you deal with, what you do with someone else's resources shows you what you really have. When I, when I got my own car and I started paying for the gas and the insurance and the repairs, I drove it a lot differently acted a lot differently around that car. Every good and perfect gift that comes from God, we have to think, what are we doing with that gift? Are we keeping it to ourselves for the love of money? Are we keeping ourselves from wanting the credit? How do we make sure that God gets all the glory? We become extravagant, cheerful givers. Hilariously so. Extravagant giving is this in a nutshell. It's it's choosing to help others over helping yourself. It's, it's choosing cheerful giving over compulsion. And it's being obsessed with God getting all the glory. And so I want to take that idea and I'll bring it back to those three key understandings we started with. Number one, what we think is good or right can actually be disruptive to our spiritual growth. How are my feelings disrupting my giving spirit? How, is it, that's not really where I wanted to be. I didn't think I would be called to do that. Oh, that, that, we, that's our savings. How have I let my preferences, my traditions, my thoughts, how have I let that invade what God is trying to do to me? Am I giving out of fear or compulsion or do I truly have a cheerful spirit? That's number one. Number two, we are worse off than we think, but we're more loved than we could ever imagine. And if you haven't looked at your bank account in a while, you might be worse off than you think. <laughs> That's what I do. Just don't look. Don't ask, don't tell, right? Whew. If, it's, if I don't look at it, it's not bad. But no, speaking spiritually, am I a cheerful giver? Or am I giving myself a pass? Do I look at other people and say, I'm really glad that they're generous because I just don't have that in me? Am I legalistic in my giving? Jesus told the Pharisees, you're, you're doing a great job giving according to the law. You know, you take all of your fine spices and you chop them up and, you know, nine here and one to God, nine here and one to God. You're doing fine with that. As a matter of fact, Matthew chapter 23, verse 23, he says, you shouldn't even stop doing that. You should have done that and cared about mercy, justice, and the poor. You should have cared about these weightier things of the law, Jesus says, and be giving. That's from where your, where your heart is coming from. They were so focused on the rules of it. Am I being legalistic in my giving or do I give out of an overflow of the blessings from God? Finally, number three, we won't grow as fast as we desire. It's not a good idea to go give away all of your money today. <laughs> I promise you that. <laughs> no matter who shows up at your door and convinces you otherwise, it's not a good idea. God wants to change you And he wants to change you over your life. He doesn't want you to just feel better because you gave some big extravagant gift. What step, what small step is God calling you to take today towards him in a long, obedient journey of being an extravagant giver? I don't want to be extravagantly giving one time. I want to live a life of extravagant giving. And that's what Paul is urging us to do in this text. So this morning... I'm going to give you an opportunity to give. No tricks, no swindling, no sales pitch. But every morning we do have an opportunity. Um, we do this online now. So northsidechristianchurch.net slash giving. Or you can text 
and set up the, the text to give on your phone, that, that's, that actually becomes really, really simple because when, um, when you feel cheerful about it, you can just text a number to that and it'll do it. Be careful because I gave like, like 10 cents to Northside once because I was like, ah, you know, fat thumbs. But, but we have an opportunity to give. The God who has given so much to us, he's given to you in excess. Is it time for you to be a cheerful giver? I'm going to make that opportunity to you this morning. I also want to make an opportunity that if you are ready to take steps towards Jesus in any of these spiritual journeys, I'd love to talk to you this morning what that looks like. What's that next step? Is it membership to the church? We've seen some of those on our Next Steps videos. Is it baptism, the step of baptism where you get into the baptistry and you give it all? You sacrifice everything and walk for Jesus. Or maybe it's just a prayer. We have our prayer team stationed around the room. Don't confuse them for the knights in shining armor. I don't think they'll pray for you, but our prayer team will. (laughs) And uh, they're around the room, so if you would like to pray with somebody this morning who's here for that purpose, we would love to do that. Would you stand with us as we sing this morning?